the glories of ireland edited by joseph dunn and p j lennox the sorrows of ireland by john jerome rooney a m l l d the sorrows of ireland what a vision of woe the words conjure up the late goldwin smith himself an englishman and a unionist in his irish history and the irish question finds that of all histories the history of ireland is the saddest for nearly seven centuries it was a course of strife between races bloodshed massacre misgovernment civil war oppression and misery the first of the great scourges of erin was the coming of the danes the bloodthirsty and conquest-loving vikings of the north the worshippers of thor and odin the gods of thunder and of strife these warriors in never-ending invasions had for four hundred years overrun britain and finally conquered the northern provinces of gaul until the end of the eighth century ireland had been free from the scandinavian scourge about this time the invaders made lodgments along the coasts passed inward through the island burned and looted religious houses and schools of learning levied tribute upon the inhabitants and at length established themselves firmly at limerick waterford dublin wexford and carlingford fortified towns were built trading communications with britain and the continent were set up and the northmen though not in actual possession of the interior of the island was apparently in substantial control of its destinies brian baruma or baru brother of the king of munster of the dalcasian race of o'brien refused to submit roused his brother fought the danes of limerick at sulcoid a d nine hundred sixty eight and captured limerick brian later succeeded his brother became sovereign of all ireland a d one thousand one and on good friday a d one thousand fourteen joined battle with the danes upon the famous field of clontarf here the power of the northmen was forever broken brian falling at the moment of victory while in his tent by the hand of a fugitive dane with the death of brian the united government dissolved the provincial kings or princes resumed separate authority and a struggle arose among them with varying success for the national sovereignty the central government never had been strong as the nation was organized on a tribal or family basis in this weakened condition dermot mcmurrow king of leinster abducted the wife of o'rourke prince of Breffney, while the latter was on a pilgrimage mcmurrow was compelled to fly to england he sought the protection of the angevin english king henry plantagenet as a result of this appeal a small expedition headed by strongbow a d eleven sixty nine was sent to ireland and waterford wexford and dublin were taken then came henry himself in eleven seventy one with a fleet of two hundred forty ships four hundred knights and four thousand men landing at waterford this expedition was the beginning of the english attempted conquest of ireland a proceeding that through all the ruin and bloodshed of eight hundred years is not yet accomplished henry's first act was to introduce the feudal system into that southern half of the island which he controlled he seized great tracts of land which he in turn granted to his followers under feudal customs he introduced the offices of the english feudal system and the english laws and placed his followers in all the positions of power holding their lands and authority under the feudal conditions of rendering him homage and military service this was the root 
of the alien landlordism and foreign political control of future times which became the chief curses of ireland the prolific source of innumerable woes the succeeding years to the reign of henry the eighth witnessed the extension and at times the decline of the anglo-norman rule when henry the seventh became king of england the anglo-norman colony or pale had shrunk to two counties and a half around dublin defended by a ditch many of the original norman knights had become more irish than the irish themselves such was the great family of the geraldines or fitzgerald the most powerful with the o'neills of the north in ireland a united attack at this time would most certainly have driven out the invader for it must be remembered that dublin the pale the castle government of later times was the citadel of the english foreign power and before a united nation would most certainly have succumbed when henry the eighth ascended the throne of england the policy of peace in ireland was continued during the early portion of his reign then came henry's break with the pope over the royal divorce the irish beyond the pale and many within it were loyal to the church of their fathers to the faith of patrick the faith of the roman see to henry and his daughter elizabeth the daughter of anne boleyn who displaced henry's lawful wife this was treason henceforth to the bitterness of race hatred and the pride of the conqueror were to be added the blackest of religious feuds the most cruel of religious persecutions in the history of the world again let goldwin smith the english unionist describe the result of all the wars waged by a civilized on a barbarous seek and despised race these wars waged by the english on the irish seem to have been the most hideous no quarter was given by the invader to man woman or child the butchering of women and children is repeatedly and brutally avowed nothing can be more horrible than the cool satisfaction with which english commanders report their massacres famine was deliberately added to the other horrors what was called law was more cruel than war it was death without the opportunity for defence and with the hypocrisy of the forms of justice added out of this situation came the infamous penal code which by the period of william the third about sixteen hundred ninety two became a finished system this is the irish code of which lord brougham said it was so ingeniously contrived that an irish catholic could not lift his hand without breaking it and edmund burke said the wit of man never devised a machine to disgrace a realm or destroy a kingdom so perfect as this montesquieu the great french jurist philosopher the author of the epoch-making spirit of the laws commented it must have been contrived by devils it ought to have been written in blood and the only place to register it is in hell yet for two hundred years this code of death national and individual was the supreme law of ireland wendell phillips the great american orator in his lecture on daniel o'connell summed up this penal code in words that will not soon be forgotten by the world his reference to mr frode is to james anthony frode the english historian he says you know that under it an irish catholic could not sit in the house of commons he could not hold any commission from the crown either civil or military he could be a common soldier nothing more he could neither vote nor sit on a jury nor stand on a witness stand nor bring a suit nor be a doctor nor be a lawyer nor travel five miles from his own home without a permit from a justice of the peace the nearest approach that ever was made to him was a south carolina negro before the war 
he had no rights that a protestant needed to respect if he was a landholder if all his children were catholics he was obliged to divide the land equally between them this was the english plan for eliminating the catholic tenure of the land and letting it slip out of their hands then if any of the children during their father's life concluded to become protestants in such case they took the whole estate or indeed they might compel the father to put his estate in trust for their benefit so if the catholic wife would not go to an episcopalian church once a month which she deemed it a sin to do she forfeited her dower but if she went regularly she could have all the estate if a catholic had a lease and it rose one quarter in value any protestant could take it from him by bringing that fact to the notice of a justice of the peace three justices of the peace might summon any catholic before them and oblige him to give up his faith or quit the realm four justices could oblige him to abjure his faith or sell his estates if a protestant paid one dollar tax the catholic paid two if a protestant lost a ship when at war with a catholic power and at the time there was only one protestant power in europe besides great britain that was holland so that the chances were nine to one that in case of war great britain would be at war with a catholic power in such a case if a protestant lost a ship he went home and assessed the value on his catholic neighbours and was reimbursed so of education we fret a great deal on account of a class of irishmen who come to our shores and are lacking in education in culture and refinement but you must remember the bad laws you must remember the malignant legislation that sentenced them to a life of ignorance and made education a felony in catholic ireland if an irishman sent his child to a protestant schoolmaster all right but if a parent would not do so and sent him to a catholic school the father was fined ten pounds a week and the schoolmaster was fined five pounds a week and for the third offence he was hung but if the father determined that his child should be educated and sent him across the channel to france the boy forfeited his citizenship and became an alien and if discovered the father was fined one hundred pounds and anybody except the father who harboured him forfeited all civil rights that is he could not sue in a court of law nor could he vote indeed a catholic could not marry if he married a protestant the marriage was void the children were illegitimate and if one catholic married another it required the presence of a priest and if a priest landed in ireland for twenty minutes it was death to this ferocious code sir robert peel in our own day added the climax that no catholic should quit his dwelling between the hours of sunset and sunrise an exaggeration of the curfew law of william the conqueror now you will hardly believe that this was enacted as a law but mr froude alludes to this code yes he was very honest he would paint england as black as she deserved he said of queen elizabeth that she failed in her duty as a magistrate she failed towards ireland in her capability of being a great ruler and then he proceeded after passing sentence to give us the history of her reign and showed that in very many cases she could not have done any different for instance oh it is the saddest blackest most horrible statement of all history it makes you doubt the very possibility of human nature when you read that spencer the poet who had the most ardent most perfect ideas in english poetry spencer sat at the council board that ordered the wholesale butchery of a spanish regiment captured in ireland and to execute the order he chose sir walter raleigh the scholar the gentleman the poet the author and the most splendid englishman of his age and norris a captain under sydney in whose veins flowed the blood of sir philip writing home to elizabeth 
begs and persuades her to believe in o'neill's crimes and asks for leave to send a hired man to poison him and the virgin queen makes no objection mr froude quotes a letter from captain norris in which he states that he found himself in an island where five hundred irish all women and children not a man among them had taken refuge from the war and he deliberately butchered every living soul and queen elizabeth in a letter still extant answers by saying tell my good servant that i will not forget his good services he tells us that the english nobility and gentry would take a gun as unhesitatingly as a fowler and go out to shoot an irishman as an indian would a buffalo then he tells us with amazement that you never could make an irishman respect an englishman he points to some unhappy kildare the sole relic of a noble house whose four uncles were slaughtered in cold blood that is the only word for this kind of execution slaughtered and he left alone a boy grows up characterless and kills an archbishop every impetuous and patient act is dragged before the prejudiced mind but when mr froude is painting sir walter and spencer blind no longer he says i regret it is very sad to think that such things should ever have been such was the cup from which ireland drank even into the days of men now living nor was this all the rise of english manufactures brought a new chapter of woes to ireland the irish cattle trade had been killed by the act of charles the second for the benefit of english farmers the irish then took up the raising of wool and woollen manufactures a flourishing trade grew up an english law destroyed it in succession the same greed killed the cotton the glove-making the glass-making and the brewing trades these were reserved for the english maker and merchant these crimes upon irish industry surpassed a thousandfold the later english attempts upon the industries of the american colonies under the code and through the extreme poverty produced thereby substantially all the land of ireland passed out of the hands of the people they became mere serfs upon the soil their tribute was paid through a rapacious agent to a foreign landlord the improvement of the land by the labour of the tenant brought increase of rent there was no fixity of tenure of the land it was held at the will of the agent reflecting the rapacity of the non-resident landlord upon these holdings the principal crop was the potato a failure of this crop was a failure to pay rent eviction on the roadside and starvation the results after the enactment of the penal code and during the greater part of the eighteenth century are thus described by goldwin smith on such a scene of misery as the abodes of the irish cotters the sun has rarely looked down their homes were the most miserable hovels chimneyless filthy of decent clothing they were destitute their food was the potato sometimes they bled their cattle and mixed the blood with sorrel the old and sick were everywhere dying by cold and hunger and rotting amidst filth and vermin when the potato failed as it often did came famine with disease in its train want and misery were in every face the roads were spread with dead and dying there was sometimes none to bear the dead to the grave and they were buried in the fields and ditches where they perished fluxes and malignant fevers followed laying these villages waste i have seen says a contemporaneous witness the labourer endeavouring to work at his spade but fainting for want of food and forced to quit it i have seen the helpless orphan exposed on the dunghill and none to take him in for fear of infection and i have seen the hungry infant sucking at the breast of the already expired parent all these are not only the horrors of a hundred or two hundred years ago they were repeated in ten 
thousand forms in the awful famine days of 1847. In 1841, the population of Ireland was 8,796,545 persons. In 1851, after four years of famine, the population was 6,551,970, leaving 2,244,575 persons to be accounted for, and taking no account of the natural increase of the population during the ten years not less than a million and a half of these died of starvation and the fevers brought on by famine the remainder emigrated to foreign lands in this account of the sorrows of ireland nothing has been said of the vast emigrations thousands upon thousands of persons in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries leaving ireland under forced deportations in a practical selling into slavery the sum total of this loss to ireland cannot be less than five million souls the earlier deportations were carried out under the most atrocious circumstances families were broken up and scattered to distant and separate colonies such as barbados the new england states and later to the south pacific this is but a glance at some of the wrongs to ireland's religious intellectual and material welfare wrongs that have plunged her into an age-long poverty but one of the greatest of all her sorrows has been the denial of her national life the attempt to strangle her rightful aspirations as a free people her autonomy was taken from her her smallest legislative act was the act of a stranger in fine every mark of political slavery was put upon her a foreign soldiery was and still is quartered upon her soil the control of her revenues of the system of taxation was wrested from her these became the function of a hateful resident oligarchy alien in everything to the irish people and of the english parliament to which she was not admitted until the days of daniel o'connell and then she was admitted only through fear of revolution the dawn has come the dark night is almost past the heroic struggle of ireland is about to close in triumph her loyalty to her ideals of freedom and religion is to meet its reward the epitaph of robert emmet will soon be written for at last ireland is certain of taking her place among the nations of the earth